We're in this uh, second week of this series called Stretch It Out, where our goal is to learn to embrace the pain of a growing faith, right? Embrace the pain of a growing faith. So I have a little object lesson that's uh, going to be very tactile for you today. Before this comes down and you get your little piece of what's happening, I need to be very clear, don't do anything with it at this time. It's going to be really hard for some of you, but don't do anything with it at this time. All right, guys. Go ahead and pass that out. Make sure everybody gets one. I'm not even going to talk about it right now. Just don't do anything with it at this time. Okay? So, uh, you're not going to hear anything I say for the next couple of minutes, but I'll go ahead and talk anyway. <laughs> So uh, we introduced this, this passage from <clears throat> the book of James. James was the brother of Jesus, and he wrote this letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, right? That's the Jewish Christians who were from Jerusalem and around Jerusalem who began to be persecuted for their faith. They were starting to kill Christians in Jerusalem. So all of these Christians left. They left their homes. They left their families. They left their jobs. And James is writing this letter to them, and this is what he says to these persecuted Christians. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Remember last week, we talked about shifting our perspective on pain so that we see it as an opportunity for joy. He continues, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Okay, so uh, we, we kind of got that down last week a little bit. And today what we're going to talk about is that, that time period between the testing of your faith and that moment when you are mature. When James, the way James says it here is you will be perfect and complete. So there's this testing of the faith and then there's a gap and then there's the being made perfect or complete, needing nothing. So what happens in that gap? We wait, don't we? We wait. Waiting is difficult. For those of you that are pretty sure that the, the purpose for bubble wrap, the reason bubble wrap was uh, created was to pop the bubbles, right? It, it's just a side benefit that it gets used in shipping. That's not what it's for. Those bubbles were created to be popped, and it's driving you insane right now, isn't it? Some of you are like, what are we, can, are we going to have to hold this all the, yes. I, please don't pop it until I ask you. Trust me, it will be worth the wait. Just wait. Don't pop it yet. That waiting. <laughs> Everybody's a comedian. All right. That, that waiting, that's the moment, that's that gap between being tested and being made complete. That's the moment. And we, as a society, are terrible at waiting, aren't we? Because we have, we have a culture that has built in all of these things, these conveniences that are supposed to prevent waiting, right? How many of you are hooked on Amazon Prime next day shipping? Hooked on it. Oh, I can't, I... I I ordered some shoes on eBay, and uh, since we order some things from time to time from Amazon Prime, eBay tells me it's going to be eight days for my shoes to come, and I'm thinking, what, are, are we in the Middle Ages? What, am I a barbarian that I have to wait eight days for my shoes to arrive from eBay? It felt like forever, because we've built all these things into our world so that we don't have to wait. And we avoid waiting at all costs. You go to the BMV in Tipton, right? Because anywhere else, and you're going to be there all day. Well, now I just ruined Tipton. Sorry, Keith, but that's where you get, like, we, you look for the shortest line, or you don't even wait in line at the grocery store anymore, do you? How many of you order your groceries online, you drive up and pick them up, and they're there for you? You don't have to do any waiting. That's why we do these things. We feel like waiting is like a punishment. It's a, it's a form of oppression, and we avoid it if we can. And if we can't avoid it, there better be free Wi-Fi in that waiting room, right? <laughs> like that's, otherwise, 
we're just being completely ripped off. We distract ourselves, we get anxious, we get frustrated. But what if it's in this period of waiting that God does his best work in you? This faith that we want to grow, we acknowledge, I want a stronger faith. I need more faith. I need to wake up every morning more convinced that God is with me. I need to wake up every day more convinced that God loves me, that he is for me, more convinced that his promises are true, more convinced that his way is best. I need stronger faith. And what if the way to stronger faith is through waiting? What are you waiting for? This is what we're going to call your bubble wrap test. What is your current bubble wrap test? Are you waiting for a better job? Are you waiting for a promotion to come through? Are you waiting for the right man or the right woman to come along? Are you waiting for a diagnosis to come in, for a relationship to be restored? Are you waiting for an addiction to be overcome? Are you waiting for physical healing? Are you waiting for a loved one to turn to Jesus? What are you waiting for? What's your bubble wrap test right now? I just want to encourage you that I think even though waiting feels like punishment, it feels like being controlled, it feels like being oppressed, I think waiting is in fact silent and invisible growth. And I want to encourage you today to embrace waiting for the sake of what God is doing. Embrace waiting for the sake of what God is doing. So we're going to take a look at the life of a man uh, from in the Old Testament who learned how to wait and learned how to wait patiently. We acknowledge that waiting isn't always a choice, but waiting patiently is. Waiting patiently is a choice. And this man named Joseph learned to wait patiently. His story starts in Genesis 30. Five, I should have looked that up. 34, 36, 35. <laughs> uh, yeah, just got docked in my pay for that one. Um, so his story starts in Genesis in the 30s and goes to the end of the book. And uh, I want you to follow along with me if you want to do that. But I'm going to tell you Joseph's story. We're going to start uh, from when he was about 17 years old. Uh, up to this point, Joseph was treated like the favorite son. He was, he was his father's favorite son. In, in these times, these ancient times, the firstborn son was treated with greatest honor. The firstborn son got more benefits. The firstborn son was special. Joseph was the 11th son, but he was the firstborn of his father's favorite wife. You figure that out. That sounds like a healthy family. He was the firstborn son of his father's favorite wife. So Jacob treated him like his firstborn son, and, and Joseph grew up believing that he was special. And in fact, when he was 17, he had a couple of dreams. And these dreams were about him ruling over his family. And his, his 11 brothers, he, he had another younger brother, so he had, he had 11 brothers, and his dream was these 11 brothers and even his father and mother were going to bow down and worship him, that he was gonna have this position of authority over his brothers, this dream, Joseph believed, and, and there's evidence later on to support this, came from God. So Joseph gets this, this promise from God that one day you will rule over your brothers. And at 17, Joseph is thinking, I'm ready, <laughs> right? That's, that's how 17-year-old guys work. I'm ready. Like, there's no time like the present, God. I am ready to rule over my brothers. Let's make this happen now. So he tells them about these dreams. He says, guys, you're not going to believe what's going to happen. One day, one day, you are going to bow down and worship me. Now, how do you think that went over with his brothers? Did that, did that foster a lot of endearing, you know, did they, you know, a lot of noogies and stuff happening after that, wedgies and things? It went way beyond that. In fact, his brothers decided, uh, let's just kill him. We can put an end to that drama right now. We can just end his life. They don't kill him. Instead, they sell him into slavery. And Joseph experiences his first period of waiting when he was so sure. He was so sure, I'm ready. I'm ready to lead. I'm ready to, to be in authority. I'm ready to rule over my brothers. And instead, he goes from the favorite son of a wealthy man to a slave in a foreign land. 
And in this moment, Joseph is faced with the reality, I am not in control of the timing. That's what waiting patiently has to admit. Waiting patiently admits, I am not in control of the timing. And this may be the most difficult aspect of waiting for us. God, I want to see my marriage restored now. God, I want to see my friend healed now. God, I want to see my brother come to Jesus now. I've been praying for him for 20 years. And every time I pray, I think, now. God, there's no time like the present. Let's make this happen now. I want to see my finances secured now. I want to see my job situation resolved now. If I were in control, God, I would just go ahead and do this now. I don't understand why we're waiting. But Joseph has to wait. He has to admit that he's not in control of the timing. He has to get to a place where he's able to say, I would rather God be in control than to get what I want most. I would rather God be in control than to get what I want most until I become the kind of person where what I want most is for God to be in control. Did you guys get that? Listen, this is really important. This this can shift your perspective. Can you say, I would rather God be in control than to get what I want most until I become the kind of person who can say, what I want most is for God to be in control. This is the, the position that Joseph finds himself in. So he works as a slave. He learns some humility in this house of this man named Potiphar, who's high up in the Egyptian government. He's the captain of the guard. He's a powerful man. And we get this really uh, interesting and I think amazing uh, re- revelation that God is with Joseph. God is with Joseph. Genesis 39, 2. Joseph goes into slavery in Potiphar's house, and it says the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. It didn't feel like God was with him when he was sitting in the bottom of that pit, waiting to be sold into slavery. It didn't feel like God was with him when when he moves into this house as a slave. It didn't feel like God was with him as he's in this foreign land, and he's separated from his family. It didn't feel like God was with him, and yet it's so clear that God was with Joseph. So he rises to second in command in the house of Egypt, of Potiphar in Egypt. And I think what Joseph learned in this moment is that waiting teaches me that God is present even in my pain. What is it that you're waiting for? And while you're waiting, my guess is it may not feel like God is with you. It may feel like God is very far from you. It may feel like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. It it may feel like God is busy somewhere else and, and he's kind of turned his back on you for a while. Let me tell you something. That is not true. It's actually a lie from our enemy because God is with you while you wait. He is with you. He is absolutely with you. So he's with Joseph as he rises to second in command in the house of Potiphar, and he's got to start believing. He remembers these dreams from when he was 17, and he's like, okay, I'm second in command in the house of this powerful man in the land of Egypt, which is a powerful nation. Maybe now's the time when God is going to elevate me to this position of authority over my brothers, just like I dreamed about. But then Joseph gets falsely accused of attempted rape of his master's wife and sent to prison. Another setback, right? Another moment that causes Joseph to doubt the promise that God gave him, to doubt that God is with him, to doubt that God is going to bring something good. This is another opportunity to doubt that. He goes from being second in command in the home of a powerful man to being a prisoner falsely accused of a crime. But then you read this in Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Even in prison, even when things seem to be at their worst, God is with Joseph. And I want you to know that God is with you. When you're convinced that God is with you, you can not only endure difficulty, you can thrive in it. 
You can thrive in it when you're convinced that God is with you. It gives a purpose to your pain. It gives you something to think about, something to focus on while you're waiting. And then maybe the waiting won't feel so bad. My wife and I uh, went out to dinner several years ago. Um, we've been out to dinner since then. But like, <laughs> this one time when we went out to dinner, uh, we were kind of splurging at this nice place, Carabas. Uh, and uh, we, we sat down, we ordered our food. And uh, we just sat and talked. Uh, we talked about the boys. We talked about our, our future and our past. And um, before long, the waiter came by and he said, listen, guys, I am so sorry that your food's not out yet. I don't know what's going on. Let me go, let me go check and find out what's going on. So he, he disappears and we're like, what was that about? A few minutes later, the manager comes by and he says, guys, I, I can't believe that your food has taken so long to get out. This is terrible. Listen, it's on us tonight, including a dessert. You guys order whatever you want and it's on us tonight. And we're like, sweet, but what are you talking? For us, we looked at each other and we thought, how long have we been here? It didn't feel like very long to us, but apparently we sat there for a long time not realizing that our food hadn't come. And listen, that's not me, okay? <laughs> that's not normal. But, but we were so engaged in, in our conversation and so enjoying talking to each other that the waiting just, it, we didn't even notice it. And I think this is what God wants to grow us up into is the kind of people who can wait with such a confidence that God is with us, that, that we're so focused on him and we're so dependent on him that waiting no longer feels painful, but it's actually, it's, it's actually a good thing. So Joseph waits. He's in prison. More humility, more faithful service. I think it's really important to point out that Joseph is continually faithful and obedient even when it feels like God is far away, Joseph acts as a person who wants to honor God. The reason why he gets falsely accused of, of attempted rape against his master's wife is because he refused her advances. And it, and it says in the text that Jake, Joseph refused her because he didn't want to dishonor God. Why was he so focused on God at a time when it, it should have felt like God was far away? He knew God was with him, and that, that confidence caused him to be faithfully obedient while he waited. I think that's really important that we're able to continue to, to obey. So he rises his second in command in the prison. God is with him. God blesses him. And, and he gets a chance to interpret some dreams for some important people. These two guys are sent to prison, a baker and a cupbearer for the Pharaoh. And Joseph gets a chance to interpret their dreams. One of them turns out bad. The baker doesn't make it. Uh, one of them turns out good. The cupbearer uh, is going to get restored to his place at Pharaoh's side. And so Joseph says, hey, <laughs> when you get back in, into the throne room of the most powerful man in this nation, would you please remember what I did for you? Would you possibly, if you could slip it into a conversation, let him know that there's this guy in prison that doesn't belong there and maybe should get out? And so he sends this cupbearer off with this message thinking, he's got to be thinking any day now, any day now, this cupbearer is going to tell Pharaoh that Joseph should not be in prison. Now I'm going to get out. Two years go by after the cupbearer is released. Two years in which Joseph has got to be doubting. He's got to have some moments where he completely, he thinks back to these dreams from when he was 17. He's almost 30 now. And he thinks back to these dreams from when he was 17 that he was going to rise to this position of authority. And he's, he's got to be wondering, was I, was I wrong about that? Did I make that up? Was that just in my head? Was that really from God? Or did I, just, did I just read something into that that wasn't really there? There has to be these moments of doubt. Yet, in spite of that doubt, in spite of the lack of evidence that God is ever going to answer this promise, Joseph is faithful and obedient. He honors God with the way he treats other people and with the way that he serves in prison. And then his, fi his time finally comes when Pharaoh has a dream and the cupbearer remembers, oh yeah, dreams, prison, Joseph. We need to talk to Joseph. Joseph comes before the Pharaoh. He interprets the dreams correctly. He offers a plan for how the nation of Egypt can get through the famine that's going to be coming in seven years. And he is brought out of prison and made second in command in the nation of Egypt. He finally arises to this position of authority. And Joseph is finally the person that he needs to be for God's promise to be revealed in his life. And that happened through the waiting. Waiting shapes me into the right person for what's next. 
This is the hope that I want you to hang on to today. If you're waiting for something and you've been waiting for a while and, and you've had your moments of doubt and you've had your moments where you felt like God is far away, maybe this waiting is shaping you into the right person for what's next. And so Joseph's brothers have to come to Egypt to buy grain during the famine. And he sees his brothers, these, these guys who wanted to kill him, but who actually sold him into slavery into a foreign land, having no idea what his fate would be, whether he would live or die. And when he sees his brothers, he loves them and he forgives them. He invites his whole family to move down to Egypt. And later on, when his father dies, his brothers come to him and they say, okay, uh, now that dad's gone, we're pretty sure you were just being nice to us because dad was still around. Now that dad's gone, um, please don't kill us. And here's what Joseph has to say to them in Genesis 50, 20. This is so powerful. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. What you did to me seemed like a really bad thing at the time, but it was actually a good thing. Wouldn't it be amazing to look back on your moments of pain, to, to flip back through uh, your period of waiting and say, I, I know this felt bad at the time and it seemed awful, but man, if that hadn't happened, then this awesome, amazing, good blessing from God would never have come. What, what the enemy means for evil, God can turn into something good. And this wasn't even good for Joseph. Joseph points out, this wasn't even about me. This was about all the people that are saved through Joseph's plan to get Egypt through the famine. All the people who didn't starve to death because God let Joseph go through this horrible time of slavery and imprisonment, of waiting, of being shaped and molded into the right person so that he could be a benefit to the people around him when the right time came. I, I know that it's easy to look at, at these stories from the Old Testament and think, man, those people were just on a different level. You know, Joseph, yeah, I mean, that's pretty amazing that he waited, but he's in the Bible, so isn't he like some super Christian kind of thing? Like, I don't know if I can really do that. Here's what I want you to know. There are, there are real people all around you that are being faithful through waiting. And I want to share one of those stories with you uh, over this video right now. So, I think I had, um, you know, I had always wanted children, but I was busy with a career and with life, and so we really didn't start thinking about that until we'd been married seven or eight years. And um, whatever, within the first year, I realized that there was going to be problems. And so I, you know, I, I had met with a fertility doctor, and I was really surprised. I think they gave me about a 3% chance to be able to get pregnant. And I had, even at that time, I'd always felt like God had given me this promise that I was going to carry a child. It was a difficult process. Um, over the next several years, it took about four years. Um, over the next several years, I went through three surgeries. Um, we lived in Louisiana at the time, and I saw several fertility doctors in Louisiana. Um, and they did not give me a lot of hope that things were going to happen. And so we started looking at other options and ended up deciding to do fertility treatment in New York. And so we would actually leave Louisiana and we would fly to New York and do in vitro in New York. And we did three cycles of in vitro. Right before the first cycle of in vitro, we got a call um, that it was a friend of a friend. We knew was pregnant, um, but we didn't know anything else besides that, just that she was young and she was pregnant. And she called and she said, um, would you be interested in adopting this child? I'm due in three weeks. And of course, we were just completely blown away. Um, it, was, it was an unbelievable you know, answer to prayer and an opportunity that not a lot of people have whenever you're looking at the fact that you may never have children. Even though I had this promise and I was holding on to it, at this point I had gone through so many tests and treatment and processes and had never even had the hope of becoming pregnant. So in February of, um, let me think, 2012, Ryland was born and it was, uh, it, it gave a lot of, it was like a lot of balm, a balm to our souls. Um, it helped 
It helped in really difficult times. It helped in a, a, a really, really difficult time. But even with that, I still had this promise from God that I was, I felt as if I was going to carry a child. So he was born in February. We had just gone through the first failed in vitro process. We did another in vitro in July, and it was another failed in vitro. And my doctor in Louisiana, he told me, he said, you should stop trying. And he said, this is not going to happen for you. You need to be content. You're very fortunate that you've been able to adopt a healthy baby, and um, you shouldn't move forward with anything else. And at this point, um, there were other people that loved for me and cared for me, but nobody else believed that I was going to carry a child. They just didn't believe that. And I, I had a lot of doubt myself because I couldn't get pregnant naturally. We had invested all this time and energy and emotional energy and all of our financial resources into the in vitro process and it had not occurred and it had not happened. And, um, and it's hard whenever your doctor tells you that. Abe, my husband, agreed to one last cycle of in vitro <laughs> and he said, how are you going to feel when it fails? And I said, it's not going to fail this time. And so we went to New York. We had a one-year-old at that point, Ryland, and we went to New York in the, the end of March in 2013. And we did one last cycle of in vitro, and this was it. It really was it. Um, I knew that it was it. The doctor knew that it was it. Um, you know, Abe knew that it was it. And so they put back two little embryos on Saturday. We flew back home on Sunday. And on Monday, I started throwing up. <laughs> and four days later, I got my first positive pregnancy test. And, um, and Creed was born. Uh, he was born. He was born early. He was born eight weeks early, but he was born in November of that year. And that was a hard promise to hold on to for four years whenever you've been told that all the odds are that against you and that it is not going to happen. Your doctor tells you, the people in your life tell you that, that it's not something that you should, should continue to hold on to. But I knew that God had promised that to me. And I knew that that was something that I could hold on to even when the, dif the very, very difficult times came. And there were a lot of difficult days, a lot of really, really hard days. Um, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for both of my children. I am very grateful for both of them. Um, and I couldn't imagine life without them. <laughs> So this is Ryland, and Ryland was born in February of 2012, and this is Creed, and he was born in November of 2013, and I am grateful every single day for my miracles, <laughs> and that's what I believe that they are, and I have no doubt that these are, these are both my babies that God promised me, and I love both of them very, very much. Sometimes we have to go through a period of waiting to receive what God has promised. I just want to encourage you today to embrace waiting for the sake of what God is doing because something good is coming. Something good is always coming. God always provides. He always turns our pain into beauty. He always does that. And when he does, we should celebrate. So um, I, I hope you get a chance to talk to uh, Abe and Marie maybe today or sometime when you see them and uh, ask her what the name Creed means. If you don't already know, you should ask her because that's pretty cool. And, and celebrate with them what God has done in their lives. And, and we're going to celebrate. Just I want you to imagine, uh, get your bubble wrap ready. Don't pop it yet. Some of you are so excited. I want you to imagine, I want you to think about the thing that you're waiting for. Think about the thing that you're waiting for. What are you waiting for God to do? Are, are you waiting for a relationship to be restored, an addiction to be overcome? Are, are you waiting for financial peace? What is it that you're waiting for? And I want you to imagine the moment when you're going to celebrate what God does at the end of your waiting. So uh, get it ready. So the best thing to do as a group is we're going to just twist it, like ball it up and twist it. And on the count of three, we're going to do that. Don't do it yet. Oh, gosh, you're so excited. Is everybody ready? One, two, three. That is so awesome. It sounds like the world's biggest bowl of Rice Krispies. 
All right, all right, knock it off. Okay, that was really cool. Was it worth the wait? Absolutely, worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Whatever it is that you're waiting for God to do, it's worth it. All right, grown-ups, knock it off. It's not the kids. I can see you, it's not the kids. Here, here's a couple things I, I wanna encourage you to do from the life of Joseph. First of all, give control to Jesus. Waiting is a moment when you have to admit that you're not in control of the timing and you have an opportunity to offer it, to voluntarily say, I don't trust myself as much as I trust you, God. Would you be in control? Would you be in control of the timing? Give control to Jesus. Not just control. I think a lot of us think, well, I did that a long time ago. You know, I got baptized. I did the whole thing and I gave control to Jesus. No, no, no. That's not a one and done. Give control of this moment to Jesus. Trust him with this moment, with this thing that's on your heart, with this thing that you, you've been waiting so long and you don't know how much longer you can wait. Give control of the timing to Jesus. Second, remind yourself daily that God is with you. Build some reminders into every single day that God is is with you. He is with you. He is for you. He loves you. And he is working up something good. And you need to be reminded of that we forget that so quickly. You believe it right now. Two hours from now, you're going to forget it. Tomorrow morning, you're going to forget it. Wednesday morning, you're going to forget. So build some reminders into your day that God is with you. Maybe that's your chair time that you spend every morning. Maybe it's the daily office that you practice throughout the day, every day, two or three or four times a day where you take five minutes just to be reminded who you are and whose you are. Remember that God is with you. And number three, find someone who will wait with you. Waiting is so much easier when you're not doing it by yourself, isn't it? You know those moments when you've been in the waiting room by yourself and the anxiety and the boredom and the frustration. But if you have somebody with you to talk to and share that moment, it's so much easier. Find someone who will wait with you and hold on tight because you're gonna need them. Embrace waiting for the sake of what God is doing. It's absolutely worth the wait. And finally, I wanna point out that your waiting and what comes at the end of your waiting may not be for you. Everything that Joseph went through, it wasn't so that one day he could be a powerful and wealthy ruler in Egypt. Everything that he went through was for other people to receive a blessing through what he endured. Maybe you're waiting. What's on the other side of that is a blessing for someone else. This is not just about you. Maybe you're waiting so that God can shape you into the kind of person that can share the gospel with someone who needs to hear it. Maybe you're waiting so that God can can do through you some some comforting and and encouraging of some people that that are gonna need it down the road. Maybe, Maybe what you're waiting for is not really about you, but it's for somebody else. I wanna ask you to lift this up this morning as we close with prayer. What is it that you're waiting for? Are you willing to embrace it for the sake of what God is doing? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for this morning and this this opportunity to be reminded that waiting isn't a bad thing, that we can wait patiently in a way that honors you, in a way that shapes us, in a way that prepares us to be a blessing to others. It's so hard. It's so easy to forget that you're at work, but I believe it. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here that, that we would walk away with today with conviction that you are with us, and that it's going to be worth the wait. Would you do that in us and through us? And God, may the result of our faithful obedience as we wait be that more people become followers of Jesus Christ as we show and tell the gospel. Would you do that in us and in our community and in the world? In Christ's name we pray, amen.